name is Dave Stout. I'm from the Portland area. I am not a pastor. I teach a couple of Bible studies. Um, I was in a right division church and taught there for uh, about a year, year and a half, just doing this on an all-church Sunday school. Um, I came to the Grace Message because my father dragged me to a conference in Rockaway every year. And... Uh, it's a the conference. It is a conference in Rockaway that uh, goes dates all the way back to my grandparents and the, I don't know if you guys know the Walkers. The Walkers' parents. Uh, it started back in Canada, I think, about 30 years ago, um, and then it moved to Rockaway about 16 years ago. Um, and then when I went started attending the church and we, I started teaching there. Um, so that's a little bit about me. My wife April is here. My daughters Natalie and Jocelyn. So they're all there. Hi, girls. <laughs> is my hair okay? So, yeah, like John said, we're going we're gonna to try and get through um, a little bit of chapter 3 of Galatians, which is a monumental task. Um, I'm going to try and do 12 verses this evening, which my girls have been teasing me. I've never done 12 verses in one setting before. So we're just going to hit the highlights, and hopefully we'll spur some things. You guys can go and, and do some more study on your own. Like John said, we're going to have, I think, actually two Q&A sessions, one tomorrow morning and one tomorrow afternoon, looking at the schedule. Um, but let's uh, start, Turn to, like I said, Galatians 1, and we'll just read down the first 12 verses here. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Grace be to you, and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God, do I, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. So a real quick, Galatians, it's one, probably one of the, if not the first letter that Paul wrote. Um, it was not written to one assembly, but to the churches that are in a region of Galatia, what we would call modern-day Turkey. Um, and the problem there was the Galatians had got saved by grace, and now somebody was coming in, and they were mixing law and grace. They got saved by grace. They were trying to get sanctified by the law, by the works of the flesh. Some people had come in trying to put them under the law, trying to make them walk in the flesh for their maturity. If you look over at Galatians 3, verse 1, it says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? And that's really what he lays out here in the book of Galatians. It's a book of correction. He's trying to correct their behavior to bring back from error, from some deviation, to a just standard as to truth. And the, you'll see, Paul, as Paul goes through here, he talks about the truth. And when he's talking about the truth, he's talking about the gospel that he preached. And we'll see that as the weekend goes on. But they were putting themselves back under the law. They were saved by grace, but living by law. And they should have been doing grace living. Now, one thing, when you look at Paul's epistles, you can tell pretty much what's going on in the local assemblies there by the things that Paul says, by the things that Paul addresses. And in every book, Paul defends his authority. Even if you go to the book of Philemon, you can find at least three or four verses where Paul very clearly says, hey, I have authority here. It's an issue that we talk about a lot because Paul talks about it a lot. Even in Paul's day, his very authority was being attacked. And that's how he starts this book. He starts this book defending his apostleship. There's three ways that the adversary attacks. He's going to attack the message, and then he's going to attack the messenger, and then he's going to discourage or discredit the messenger. And you see all those happen here. 
if you, we just saw in 3, one, look over at uh, chapter 5, verse 1. Those of you that aren't familiar with me, I look at it, we go to a lot of verses. I don't quote many verses, we go to a lot of verses, so get your fingers warmed up. <laughs> those, and those of you that are, I, we have a lady up in Portland that she, she uses a tablet. She told me the other day, she goes, she's probably watching right now, so I shouldn't let her in on this. She, <laughs> she goes, I, uh, I don't think I'll ever use a pipe paper Bible again. She loves it. So now I go to three or four verses because she can't get them all at the same time. So. <laughs> Anyhow, Galatians 5, verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. The book of Galatians is a refutation of the attack on the message. The Galatians, again, were being taught to live according to the law, and Paul continued through this whole book, reminds them, that's not, you guys are not under the law. You cannot become mature by the law. That is a yoke of bondage that you're putting yourself under. The attack on the messenger, you can see that back in Galatians 1, verse 1. It says, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. We're going to look at this in a, in a moment. But they were, these people that were coming in trying to put the Galatians under the law, they were attacked. The first thing they did was attack Paul's apostleship, his ability, his authority to say what he was saying, and they tried to discredit him that way. And then if you look in chapter 1, verse 13, you'll see that trying to discourage and discredit Paul. It says, For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profit in the Jews a religion above many mine equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. He's not bragging there. He's saying, I know you've heard about this. It was a rumor. People, and it was happened to be true. But they were coming and say, you can't listen to Paul. Look at what he did in his past. He's a hypocrite. He can't be doing this. So you see all three ways the adversary Satan attacks is right there in the beginning, beginning of the book. So we start in, in verse 1. Paul, an apostle... Of course, we know he was the apostle of the Gentiles. Paul's very clear here that he didn't receive his apostleship of men, neither by man, one man. It's interesting, too, that he breaks it out separately, not of men, which would be plurality, nor neither by man, which would be one. Now, in, here he's not defending the gospel he preached. He's going to do that in a few verses, but here he's defending his apostleship. When, and we've got to be careful here. When Paul speaks of his apostleship and his authority, he's not talking about himself. He's talking about the office that he holds. And that's different than when he was a Pharisee. In Paul's old life, quote-unquote, when he was a Pharisee, he did magnify himself. He did boast of his authority. He said, look at me. He had his own righteousness, which he thought was of the law. Completely different. It, we'll look at this a couple things as we go through how different Paul as a Pharisee was versus Paul the Apostle of the Gentiles and how his thinking there had completely changed we're going to see that Paul didn't see himself as a sinner when he was a Pharisee but he, he came to after the revelations he got from Jesus Christ but anyhow now he magnifies his office he understands that he is simply the vessel that Jesus Christ used to declare grace and peace to the world today it's through Paul that there's a new revelation given to the world today. Again, the authority is the office, not the man. Therefore, Paul has authority, the authority that comes with the office, not unlike our presidents. President Obama has the authority of the office now. President Bush had the authority six years ago, eight years ago, Clinton before that. Whoever was in the office had the authority, but, the, uh, but once in, at the end of their terms, that authority is gone, but the authority rests in the office. Paul's authority was because he held the office that Jesus Christ gave him of the apostle to the Gentiles. So the first attack here is that he was an apostle just like the twelve, that he received his apostleship and therefore his doctrine from them. He starts by reminding the Galatians that he got, in fact, got it from Jesus Christ. His apostleship is divinely ordained. It says, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father. Now, lest you think that this was a specific attack that was being made there in Galatia, it stills occur today. I go to a men's Bible study every, uh, in, during the school year, and we sit around and talk, and needless to say, I take a lot of shots, but they sat down, and as we were talking one day, we're, they're talking about Paul tomorrow. They want to be Israel, and it's, it, 
different. So you need, in, you need Paul to have gotten his authority from Peter, from the 12. He says, first thing to the Galatians, that didn't happen. And I want to look at this for a couple of, because I want, the men is pretty easy to figure out. That would be, most people would agree, a reference to the 12, right? The, the, the 12 apostles. And the, the, where it says, neither by man, that could be Peter. But I, I think it's actually a, a different guy than, than Peter. I think he covers Peter when he talks about not of men. But look at um, verse 1, chapter 1, verse 16. Verse 15, it says, But when it pleased God, who separated from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were the apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days, but other of the of the apostles saw I none save James the Lord's brother and then look at chapter 2 verse 1 then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also and I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles but privately to them which are were of reputation lest by any means I should run or had run in vain but neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you, but of those who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's person, for they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. Paul communicated to the 12 what he was preaching. They didn't communicate to him. And if Peter was supposed to give Paul his authority and give Paul his doctrine and bring Paul, now that Paul got saved, bring him up to speed what was going on, would he have waited three years? Would he have waited 14 years? And could he have done it in 15 days? I was thinking about that. You got Paul who's persecuting the church. He's newly saved, a babe in Christ, and in 15 days, he's going to come to a full understanding of the mystery of Christ. So that's the men. But again, I want to come back to what was what about the man mentioned in verse one? It could be Peter, but I don't think it's Peter. Look over at Acts nine. And you've got to remember, he's refuting an attack that others are making him making here. And there was one man at the very beginning with Paul. Acts nine. The account on the road to Damascus. Verse 10. So Paul is in Damascus now. He's in there three days. Can't see, didn't eat, didn't drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For, behold, he prayeth. And hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he may, might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake, and Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. I think the man Paul is referring to here is Ananias. And I believe the attack was people were coming and say, you know what? Paul didn't get anything special. Ananias was there and told him what he was supposed to do. And if it wasn't Ananias, then he went up and Peter certainly did it. Luke says that Ananias, though, he, all he was supposed to do was restore Paul's sight. There's nothing about Ananias re telling Paul anything doctrinal at all. Paul's point is, guys, this has nothing. I got nothing from any man. And when they tried to add something to me, they couldn't add anything to me because what they were trying to add was the law. Paul's ministry, Paul's gospel that he preached is completely different than what Peter and the 12 preached. 
It's all founded on the Lord Jesus Christ, but they were preaching a, the gospel of the kingdom, and Peter, er, Paul, that's going to be bad, Paul is going to preach, is preaching the gospel of grace. Speaking of which, look over again back to Galatians 1, verse 3. So we've seen Paul's uh, refuted the attack on, on him. He said, he said, my apostleship is not of man. It's from the Lord Jesus Christ, my apostleship. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Almost any commentary, anybody you talk to will say, Paul's just saying hello. Grace is the, um, grace and peace. Grace is the Greek salutation and peace is the Hebrew salutation. Paul is not simply saying hello. Paul doesn't waste words. The Holy Spirit, there's not, a, there's not a wasted word in this book. Come with me to Revelation 19. We're going to come right back to Galatians. But Revelation 19 and verse 11. And I saw Revelation 19 verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. After the stoning of Stephen, of which Paul was consenting to, Jesus Christ was supposed to come back with judgment and war. But Paul is announcing grace and peace to the world. It's completely different. When Paul says, and he says it in all his epistles, when he says grace to you and peace, it's not hello. It is his declaration. It is his, he says, see it says, from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. He says to the world, God says grace, peace, be ye reconciled. It's a completely different message. Verse 4 who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. Lord Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins. And this is a good point to stop. And say, if you have not put your faith in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, do it now. Today is the day of salvation. Everything we're going to talk about this weekend is predicated on the fact that you trust the gospel. You trust in Jesus Christ's blood. He is the Son of God. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for your sins. He was buried and he rose again for your justification. That will get you saved. As we'll see through, as the weekend goes on, that'll also be the power through which you can live your life and have victory in life. Christ gave himself for our sins. Again, I say, today is the day of salvation. If you haven't taken the time, you don't have to pray you don't have to come to the altar that we don't have. <laughs> you just have to believe. You just have to trust in God's word. God's word today is put your faith in the shed blood of my son. When he talks about being delivered from this present evil world, it's an interesting concept because when you read it, it looks like, okay, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world, we're going to be raptured out of here, which is certainly true. But when you got saved, you were not removed physically from this present evil world. It says present, right now, right here. First Thessalonians 1.10 tells us the Lord Jesus Christ delivered us from the wrath to come. Being saved, we are not going through the tribulation. I want, let me be clear on that. We will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, that is the rapture, and we will forever be with the Lord. But is that what Paul is speaking about in verse 4? Don't miss, like I said, it says the present evil world. We live in this present evil world today. Look over at Galatians 2, verse 19. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me 
and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. The Lord Jesus Christ gave himself for us that we might be delivered from this present evil world. He gave himself so that we can live a life in the flesh by the, by the faith of the Son of God. The book of Galatians shows us that to move to perfection, to move on to maturity, it's done by grace. It's done by Christ living in us, by the faith of the Son of God. It's not through the law. It's not through walking in our flesh. That's the whole argument Paul's laying out here in Galatians. We can be, look over at Romans 5. We can be delivered from this present evil world, from the presence, from the course of this world. We can have victory in life we, and the details of life by living a life of grace, not a life where we put ourselves under the law. There is sometimes this thought that the gospel is only for the unsaved. That you certainly need the gospel to get saved, but then you don't need the gospel anymore. The gospel is that the Lord Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose, rose again for your justification. And that being justified freely by faith, we have peace with God. Look at Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, patience experience, experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. For we, when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. It's, the, it's through the gospel that we can glory in tribulations. Those tribulations are found in this present evil world. We can have hope. That hope leads us to not being ashamed because Jesus, that Christ died for the ungodly. Not only are we saved by the gospel, but it's through the gospel we have victory in our life. It's through the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery that we can be more than conquerors. In the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, are found the unsearchable riches of Christ. They're now searchable. That's what was what was revealed to Paul. The unsearchable riches of Christ have now been revealed. They are now searchable. We can find them out. We find those out through the Holy Spirit, which reveals them to us. The riches of Christ affect, yes, our eternal destiny, but they also affect our life in this present evil world. Look over to Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, verse 1. And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherein, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. Look over at chapter 4. This present evil world is following the course of the prince of the power of the air. It's the course that Satan set for it. It's the course that Satan wants it going down. But we don't have to succumb to it. Being saved, we don't have to succumb to it. Look over verse four, chapter four, verse seventeen. This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, 
which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. How do you get delivered from this present evil world while you live here? You put off the old man and you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. We've been studying through this passage up in Portland and we've been talking about the issue. Well, how do you do it? You starve the old man and you nourish the new man. And Bill Walker had the greatest statement. He says, you know what? That new man's feasting on the riches of God's grace. And boy, I tell you, that's, just, that's exactly what you do. Quit, stay away from the lust of the flesh. Be renewed in your mind and follow after the things of God. You don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Allow the Holy Spirit to strengthen your inner man with might. That only occurs through the study of God's word rightly divided. How does, you know, it's very easy to say, well, just let the Holy Spirit work in you. Okay, well, how does that work? Well, dispensational Bible study. You study this book the way God laid it out to be studied. You get the verses in you. That's how the Holy Spirit's going to work is through the verses. Get the verses in you. Understand which verses edify you today and which verses don't. Claim the correct verses, Romans through Philemon. The Holy Spirit uses those to convict you. You respond positively to the Holy Spirit to the gospel, your inner man begins to get strengthened with might. That might is not your might. It is not your incredible willpower. It's the might of the Holy Spirit. This process opens, happens over and over and over as you, as you mature. As you're beginning that walk of faith, you take baby steps, and then it increases, and it increases. Look over at Romans 12. Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Again, how, how do you get transformed? Is it, is it through the force, your own force of will? No, it's through the Holy Spirit working on your inner man. You can do anything through a force of will probably for a very short time. You can overcome something for a very short, short period of time, but eventually your flesh is going to take over. When you, when you rely on the Holy Spirit as that power to transform your life, that's when you'll begin to get victory. So the, thing, the, the question, well, so are you saying, Dave, we don't need to do anything? For those of you that are familiar with Rick Jordan, he has the greatest explanation of how to quit sinning stop <laughs> he's right stop but you come to rely on the Holy Spirit and you respond positively to the Holy Spirit convicting you and you're changing your inner man is changing you're not walking as the un other Gentiles walk you're not walking with that darkened understanding and it's making an impact in your life. Oftentimes people say, well, you can just, just hold your Bible on your, on your lap and God will zap you. Because you're a Christian now, God will zap you and everything will be great. No, you have a role to play. Walking in your own works, though, in your own flesh, will ultimately lead to failure. Because you're, you're not changing the inner man. You're still looking at the issue through your own eyes. You get transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit changing you, changing your inner man, so that, the per so that those issues are not who you are anymore. And you get to the point where that's not who I am. Look over at Galatians 1 again. We're, we're now starting to get delivered from this present evil world. We're understanding what God wants. We're being transformed away from the course of this world to being that particular people zealous of good works it says over in Titus Galatians 1 4 that's Corinthians Galatians 1 4 the end of the verse or the whole who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our father it is God's will that we mature that we're able to prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God we do that through the Holy Spirit transforming us, developing the mind of Christ, Christ dwelling in us, and then living out in the details of our life. 
The other thing in that verse, notice who does the delivering. It's not us. We don't deliver ourselves. Jesus Christ who delivers us from this, pre -evil, this, this present evil world. It is in Christ that victory and deliverance is found. Verse 5. To whom be glory forever and ever. Today, this present evil world, is, if you didn't know, is not giving glory to God. The events of the last week should probably show you that. Things in the news, both in Hollywood and... Where did the shooting happen? South Carolina, South Carolina. Look over at Philippians 2. I will tell you, especially the things going on in Hollywood, that's not the cause, that's the result of, God rejecting, of the world rejecting God. That is, you could not write a more perfect Hollywood script for Romans 1 than that issue. You can, you can see everything there. When you give up God, that's where you end up. It's amazing when, you, when, a, when a society begins to reject God, how everything God says will come upon them does. And it's not that God's punishing us. It's just the natural course of things. If you don't have, if, if you don't, or if you go back and read Romans, it's they weren't thankful and didn't give glory to God. And that's exactly what has happened. And you can see, you just go right down Romans 1, 18 to the end of the chapter, and you get down to the very one. Not only do they take pleasure in doing this, but they take pleasure in other people doing them. And they know they're going to be worthy of death. And that's where society has gotten to. And I don't know what that has to do with what we were talking about. <laughs> I felt good, though. <laughs> where are we, Philippians? Philippians 2, verse 8. There is a day coming when everyone will give glory to God. And being found in, uh, verse 8, and being found in fashion as a man, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So there is a day in coming when everybody in heaven, in earth, and in hell will confess that the Lord Jesus Christ is Lord, and that will bring glory to God the Father forever and ever. That's going to be a terrible moment for those people in hell. They will have spent their whole lives denying that the Lord Jesus Christ is Lord. They will finally confess it, and they will confess it in truth. And they will understand the error of their ways. If only they'd believed when they had that opportunity for salvation. Now look at verse 12 and verse 13. He talks about working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. This is not soul salvation. The, the problem in the, in the Philippian church, you can see in the early verses of chapter 2, uh, verse 3, uh, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliest of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Um, they were fighting. They were getting some stuff done, but they were fighting. And, and what he's talking about there in verse 14, do all things without murmurings and disputings. He says, work out yourself. You can deliver you guys you, yourselves from this situation. You're mature saints. You have the mind of Christ. We just talked about that. Look, the, the people you're fighting with there in the local assembly, if you esteem them better than yourselves, you're going to get deliverance from your problem, from your issue. What he's talking about, he's talking about taking the doctrine and applying it to your lives. We don't, we don't study this and get this doctrine built up in us and talk about the chart and, and talk about Paul and, and his office and all that so that we're the smartest guy in the room. We do it so we get built up and we can put the life of Christ on display. And we can, we can make others see what is the fellowship of the mystery at all. The problem with being the smartest guy in the room is there's always somebody smarter. And then if you are the smartest guy in the room, there's nobody to learn from. This is not about head knowledge. This is about, it starts there. But it's, it's, it's got to start working out of you. And that's what he's talking about here. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But don't forget verse 13. For it is God 
which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his own good pleasure. You can work it out because it's God that's working in you. It's not, again, it's not your own force of will sitting down and saying, okay, I'm going to be a better person. No, you're not. You're going to be a prideful person. Develop the mind of Christ. Let the Holy Spirit renew your inner man, and then you'll be able to walk and approve God's will. If you want to see the opposite of this, for as God which, both, which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Look over at Romans 7. Verse 15. Paul tells the Philippians they can do it because it's God working in them both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Paul has this thing. Paul wants to do what God wants him to do, but he can't get it done because he's trying to do it in his flesh. For that which I do, I, verse 15, for that which I do, I allow not. But what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that, which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law, that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. He wants to do it. He found a law that shows him how to do it, and he fails. And he says, ah, it's sin, it's in me. Ah, you just told me in chapter 6 you were dead to sin, Paul. He's relying on himself. He's not relying on God. I've never met a serious Christian that didn't want to please God. But boy, I met a lot that didn't have a clue how to do it. They're back in Exodus 19, Exodus 20. Some are back in Leviticus. I had a guy this past school year tell me, we are under the law. And I, he was consistent. He lived that way. And we got to talking about how he's motivated. He said, I, I am motivated by fear. And I'm thinking he means respect. And he said, I'm scared God's going to zap me. When good things happen. I, mean, I, I got to give him credit. The man was consistent. He said, thought he was under the law, and he lived accordingly. This is a guy, he called me out for being a dispensationalist before I'd ever do the words. <laughs> I know where my target is. His heart was to please God, but not according to knowledge. And it was all out of fear. Now, by the end of the year, he was starting to come around and see some things, but there's a lot of people that are like that. And these, they're not evil people, but they're, they're right here in Romans. I want to do it, so how do I do it? I find a law. And the law, I'll do it. Somebody went through and... and, and cataloged everything in Paul's epistles that would be, could be considered a commandment or a law, 270, 280, whatever it was. And the guy's point is what I was going to tell you. You know, Romans 12, there's a good list. Ephesians 4, there's a good list. Colossians 3, a good list of what I call do's and do nots. And what do we do? We do and do not them. If you take Paul's teachings, turn them into a law, it's the same thing. Those laws of do and do not, it's like I said, we go and we want to do and do not them. Take those things that Paul says and understand that's what a mature saint looks like. That's what you are reaching for. Again, it happens through the renewing of your mind, through the transforming of your inner man. You can never leave, never leave Romans 7 without reading chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. If you have a study Bible, it probably says the last ten words of that verse shouldn't be in there. They should be in there. 
This is not a verse about eternal security. This is a verse about not being, having that, oh, wretched man that I am, because you're walking in the Spirit, after the Spirit, not after the flesh. You're studying this book dispensationally. You're understanding what applies to you. You're applying it to you. You're in prayer. You're in meditation with it. The Holy Spirit is working on it. It's convicting you of some things. You understand, when the Holy Spirit convicts you of something, you have the opportunity to agree with the Holy Spirit or disagree with the Holy Spirit or reject what the Holy Spirit's. I mean, I guess I'm teaching, so I should admit it about myself. Yeah, there are times I go, you know what? I shouldn't be doing that. Yeah, but I'm going to do it anyhow. You have the opportunity to respond positively or negatively to the Holy Spirit. The more you respond negatively, the more you are going to continue to walk in the flesh. The more you respond positively, the more transformed, the more renewed you are going to be. That, oh, wretched man that I am, that's the only way you can feel if you're trying to go on to perfection, go on to maturity through following a list of laws. There is absolutely things that we look at, that w w what, a, what a mature saint to look at. An uh, something comes up in your life and you don't know what to do, get the book out and read the verse. We said earlier, Romans 12, Ephesians 4, Colossians 3, those will address almost every situation in life. You know, your you problem with your spouse, husbands love your wives. That pretty much answers that one. Whatever the situation is, husbands love your wives. Children obey your parents in the Lord. They knew that one. They knew that one was coming. <laughs> <laughs> Be angry and sin not. It's not tough to figure out. You got to read the book. You got to understand what's for you. You need to listen to the Holy Spirit, and you need to apply it to the details of your life. That is how, go ahead and turn back to Galatians. You get delivered from this present evil world. Galatians 6 through 12. Paul now goes, or, I'm sorry, Galatians 1, verse 6 through 12. Paul now does go into a defense of his gospel. He says in verse 6, I marvel that ye are so soon removed. They went from grace to law quickly. They were saved by faith. They understood that salvation was by grace. Someone or someones came in and said, okay, here's what you need to do now. Here's a law. You Gentiles got saved by grace. Now you need to add the law to grace. You need to add the law to live by to the grace which you were saved by. And they called it another gospel. Look at the rest of verse 6. Uh, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another gospel. So the, there's the gospel of the grace of God. And then these people were coming in and adding the law, and they were calling it another gospel. Paul says that's not a gospel. Because it's not another gospel. That's the only gospel. What do you mean get wrapped up in it? When you add the law to grace, what happens? You weaken the law, and you make grace of no effect at all. Look over at um, Romans 11. Romans 11, verse 6. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Works and grace, guys, they are mutually 100% what? Uh, opposite, thank you, big word. Opposite <laughs> each other. They have nothing in common. When you mix them, you ruin both, to be frank, frankly. In the dispensation of grace, you add law into it, you've totally destroyed, you, you're still saved, don't get me wrong, but you, when you start tr trying to live according to the law, you've totally destroyed 
how the gospel of grace can affect you, how God's grace can affect you. And is not this what the church does today? They mix law and grace. The church today is very Galatian. They say you're saved by grace, but sanctified by the law. You have to be baptized. You have to go to church. You have to say the Lord's Prayer. You have to work in the soup kitchen. You have to, your works must manifest your salvation. You, and I, let me tell you, just for the record, your works should manifest your salvation, but they don't, they're not going to necessarily. It is not how you go on to sanctification. The church calls that the gospel. You're saved by grace, by faith, but now you need to get baptized. You need to do something to show that outward expression of that inner face. Paul said that's not a gospel. If you have the law intermingled in any way with grace, you've fallen from grace. You're, you're back under the law. Look at Galatians 5. Galatians 5, verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever you are, of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. He said, you guys started great. You went back under the law. Who hindered you? That word hinder, to stop, to interrupt, to obstruct, to impede or prevent from moving forward by any means. It's exactly what happens when you add law to grace. You completely stop any growth that you may be able to have. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. We'll look at this more tomorrow or Sunday morning. You get a little law in your life. You get a little law trying to do something, and you better watch out because it'll spread. It'll spread like a disease into other parts of your life. He says that they didn't obey the truth. The truth is Paul's gospel for us today. When you're obeying the law, when you're putting yourself under the law, you are not obeying Paul's gospel. Paul says the things that he writes are the commandments of the Lord. Paul's gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. He's saying, who hindered you that you should be disobedient? They're saved, these, are, these are saved people. They're trying to go on to maturity in their own faith. And he says, you're not obeying. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Who should hinder you that you are disobeying? We'll develop that more a little bit tomorrow, like I said. Paul's whole point in this book is you cannot mix, you cannot intermingle them. They won't, it won't work. They will, because ultimately... Like I said, it makes the law weak and it makes grace of no effect. As it goes on, what it will do, the law will get stronger and stronger in you and the grace will have no effect at all on you. And you'll find yourself out trying to do all these things to get yourself to a point where you want to get that you can't get to anymore because you're stumbling over the very thing that is to get you where you're supposed to get. Well, that was obscure enough. <laughs> all right, Galatians 1. What time are we at, Joss? One five? I'm in great shape. <laughs> Verse 7, uh, which is not another, but they're... What's that? that. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that was all. That, there's our introduction. <laughs> Verse 7, uh, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Pervert the gospel of Christ. Man, what a terrible thing to say. The gospel of Christ is a term that's found 11 times exclusively in Paul's writings. Look over at 2 Corinthians 4.
2 Corinthians 4, verse 3. But if our gospel, Paul's gospel, the gospel of Christ, be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. He starts out in verse 3 talking about our gospel. That's the gospel of Christ. And he, at the end there in verse 7, he's saying, Now, guys, this treasure is in earthen vessels. And the, because when it, when it works out excellent, and it will, you understand that power is of God. It's not of our flesh. When you go on, as you go through life and maturity is happening and perfection is happening, we don't mean perfection like never sinning again. It's a statement of maturity. It's because God is working in you and it's the power of God working in you. It's not you. It's, now, he talks about the gospel of Christ. He says, our gospel. It's what he preached. Verse um, Verse 5 there, for we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. The gospel of Christ, it's Paul's body of work. It's the message of the grace of God. Paul did not preach the gospel of kingdom. He did not preach the law. There's a lot of books right now um, that will tell you that Paul taught the law. And you've got to kind of figure out how they get there. But they, they, they hang some things on, well, when he starts talking about being a Pharisee and whatnot. It's amazing, 2,000 years later, the attacks today are identical to the attacks that you can read about in Paul's epistles that were happening to him. They were perver Go ahead and go back to Galatians 5. I told you guys we'd look at a lot of verses. <laughs> Galatians 5, verse 4. And you, this, is where, this is what they were perverting the gospel of Christ with. Christ has become of no effect unto you, Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. They had perverted the gospel of Christ by adding the law to it, and it was no longer pure. You're saved by grace, you're sanctified by the law. No, you're not. You're saved by grace, and you go on to maturity through grace as well. It's been a big issue in my life. I know it's been a big issue for some people down here. You go on to maturity the same way you got saved. You're sanctified by God's grace. You're justified by God's grace. Uh, one more and one more thing, and then we'll we'll be done here. Look back to verse eight, Galatians one, verse eight. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of God. That word accursed, separated from the faithful, cast out. Paul says, these guys are teaching the law, separate from them. In fact, if I ever preach the law, if I quit preaching grace, get away from me. Paul thinks this is a serious matter. He states it twice right here. This is an issue of separation. If you're being taught to live by the law, that the law brings you to maturity, let them be accursed. Let them be cast out. Separate them from them. Do not sit under the teaching of someone today teaching the law. I know these are harsh words, but it's what Paul taught. It's the gospel of grace. It's not the gospel of grace and law. That is not another gospel. That is a perversion of the gospel of Christ. Do not think doctrine doesn't matter. Doctrine is important in your life. Proper doctrine, look over at John 8. Proper doctrine is essential to victorious, godly living. Improper doctrine will not provide victory in the details of life. It will not result in godly living. 
I'll try to show a little bit tonight, and we'll, we'll develop more as the week goes on. When Paul talks about the truth, he talks about it, he uses the word, I think, five times in Galatians. Every single time, he's talking about his gospel. John 8, 44. Says, Lord Jesus Christ speaking, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was talking to the Pharisees here. He, Satan, was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. He doesn't say the father of lies, he's the father of it, the lie. The lie is back in Genesis, yea, hath God said. That's the lie. And here's those that teach the law are saying, Yea, hath God said, By grace ye are saved through faith? Did he say that? Yea, hath God said, It is God that works in you. People teach the law. They ask a question Is there now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus that walk after the flesh but after the Spirit? I, as I said earlier, I imagine, I, I used to have a Bible. I know my the three people that are with me, they all have a Bible that says the last ten words of that book, that verse shouldn't be in there. Yea, hath God said, you're not under the law but under grace. These are all, that's the lie that's being promoted in the dispensation of grace today. Did God say these things? And if he did say them, did he mean them? Proper dispensational Bible study, studying the Bible rightly divided, it's the only way to get out of it what God, out of the Bible study, what God wants you to do. It. It's the only way to have victory in life. It's the only way to be an effective ambassador for Christ. It's the only way to put the life of Christ on display. It's only through walking after the Spirit, not after the flesh. Tomorrow we'll look at the works of the flesh compared to the fruits of the Spirit. And you're going to say, wow, okay. Even trying to live righteously through the works of the flesh, that's not going to work. Paul says it perverts the gospel of Christ. He says it's not obeying the truth. We live in the dispensation of grace. We are to declare grace and peace. We are ambassadors for Christ. Paul sets out the book. I'm the apostle that taught this. I didn't get it from men. I didn't get it from a man. I got it from the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's God's grace, and it is not the law. Period. If somebody's telling you that is the law, separate from them. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that we can come together, study your word. Thank you that you provided your word for us, Lord. And that we understand through the teachings of the Apostle Paul that, that is the truth for us today, Lord, that you are proclaiming grace and peace to the world today. And we should be proclaiming grace and peace to the world from you also, Lord. Let us recognize when the law is being applied to us by ourselves or by other people. And let us reject that as a perversion of the gospel of Christ that you tell us that it is, Lord. Let us, my prayer for all of us, Lord, would be that we would listen to the Holy Spirit, be convicted, be transformed, be strengthened in our inner man by might, the might of the Holy Spirit, that we may walk worthy and pleasing to you. We know, Lord, that this is only possible. Our salvation and our, our justification and our sanctification, our salvation and our walk, Lord, in a godly manner is only possible because of the death of your Son on the cross, and we praise you for that. And we give all glory to you for that, Lord. In your name, amen.